Welcome again. Our passage today is going to come from Philippians. Are you guys surprised? Philippians chapter 4, 14 to 20. And today's, pass, or today's um, title is called Joy and Generosity. It kind of fits with our season. Philippians chapter 4, 14 to 20. Read this out. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me with me in, rece- in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once again and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Aphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, I just pray that you may open up our ears and our hearts that we may be able to receive your words. Lord, I pray that your grace may convict us and move us, O Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts in this room be holy and pleasing to you. May your gospel be preached and may your Holy Spirit stir in our hearts. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, over the, over the past few weeks, we've been talking about different biblical principles and understanding how the gospel is applied to our hearts And I think it's so important for us to actively practice. There's a reason why Apostle Paul almost, it almost seems like he's repeating himself over and over again, just in different ways, telling us how we can apply these things in the moments of anxiety and even discontentment. I mean, they help us become rooted so that we can be firm in the Lord and hold on to the gospel promises. I mean, over the past few weeks, we learned that we have peace and contentment and we have it by praying with thanksgiving to fill our minds with thinking that comes from thankfulness. And we learn that it guards our hearts, guards our hearts and our mind, almost like an army to give us peace. Paul continues, he talks about God's sovereign hand over our situations and says that it's only Christ that strengthens us and fulfills us and satisfies us. But yet when you guys hear all this, isn't it so hard to actually live out that peace in the heat of the moment? I mean, in principle, it's easy to understand, but on the field, when life is in chaos and different things come our way, when our babies are crying and all these things are happening, I mean, how hard is it for us to actually have peace in our hearts? You know, I met a Brazilian church planner this past week, and in our conversations, um, I'm, I'm hoping, he's a church planner in Willow Grove, I'm hoping we can partner up with him in some type of way. But he talked about how there was a tragic plane crash this past Monday in Brazil where almost an entire Brazilian um, soccer team was, was killed. 71 people killed on a plane, and there was about six survivors. And he was explaining to me that it's really interesting because one of the survivors told us was telling people on the secret of his survival. And this guy, he really said, he said it was really simple. While everybody was in the plane and the plane was going down, they were standing up, they were screaming, they were in panic. They're like, what do we do? Everybody was screaming. He, he looked around and said, oh, my gosh, he sat down, calmed himself down. He picked up the instruction manual, the safety manual. He actually read it and followed the directions, put his head down into a braced position and waited for the crash. And he said, that's how he survived. And I was like, Wow. I mean, it's really simple, you know? I mean, there's so much wisdom to glean there. I mean, in the moment of panic and in the heat of chaos in our worlds and times of uncertainty, it's so important to go back to the basics of faith, to go back, to take a deep breath, to remain calm and look to God's word for guidance. I mean, simple steps, simple steps, trusting in the Lord, praying with thanksgiving, focusing on praiseworthy things, reminding ourselves of God's sovereignty and holding on to Jesus as if our lives depended on it and we can survive the waves and the chaoses in life. I mean, this doesn't mean that we won't be hurt. I mean, I'm pretty sure even the survivors had some injuries, but there's a huge difference between crashing and dying versus crashing and surviving. You know, sometimes when speaking sermons, preachers have a tendency to come out and be like, yo, have trust in God. We say cliche verses and say, hey, everything will be okay. But in reality, in our lives, everything's not okay. I mean, we reflect on it. We pray on it. We try it. 
the worries in life come our way. And I know it's hard to trust and let alone even think about God at times. And I'm like that too. It's so hard to do what I preach. But I confidently believe and have experienced in the past as well that those who stop and pray and meditate on God's word for guidance, there's a spiritual and distinct peace that comes over our hearts. It does. And I hope and pray that you may experience that peace from above. Amen? Amen. You guys got to give me stronger amens. You know, today we're going to hit on the second part on how we can find godly contentment. We started last week, and we're continuing again today. If you remember last week, we talked about how contentment is found when we finally realize that true contentment doesn't come from gaining things in this world, but it comes from knowing what we have in Christ and being filled with him because he's the only thing that's satisfied. I mean, we learned that no matter how many material things that we acquire or how much worldly recognition or respect we get, no matter how much security we have, it can leave us feeling empty if we're not filled with, from within, with, from God, knowing that we're a child of God. And in fact, the Bible says that when we are content in Christ, when everything around us is not working well, we can still be content in this life. And today, Paul continues that conversation in telling us another way to practice this, another way to practice contentment. And he says this is by living a life of generosity. Paul is saying that one of the roads to contentment and joy is flipping the script. I mean, it's not living to get, but living to give. I mean, now most people, when they're thinking about contentment, they think, if I can just get what I need, if I can just get my wants, then I'll be content. I mean, this is, this is kind of how, how we think. Well, Paul in our, in our text is saying, at times, contentment works the opposite way opposite way in america we're so we're so we're so used to this though like you know you know we're, we're we love buffets because you know we can eat more than we want we can we can continue to do this it's more i read this poem i read this poem that kind of kind of depicted on on our lifestyles that kind of go in circle over and over again now let me let me ask if this is how you feel at times it was spring but it was summer i wanted the warm days and the great outdoors it was summer, but it was fall I wanted, the colorful leaves and the cool and dry air. It was fall, but it was winter I wanted, the beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season. It was winter, but it was spring I wanted, the warmth and the blossoming of nature. I was a child, but it was adulthood I wanted, the freedom and respect. I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted, to be mature and sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 I wanted, the youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle age I wanted, the presence of mind without limitations. My life was over, and I never got what I wanted. I mean, this is so true. The constant searching, but we're never content. But here Paul shows us another way that actually works. In our passage, we see that Paul received, just received a bunch of different material goods. Or I don't, I'm not really sure what they brought him from the Philippian church through a guy named Aphrodite. So I actually practiced that name over and over again just so I don't butcher it. But Aphrodite comes with all this stuff, and he's, Paul says that he received in abundance. And it wasn't their first time either. They gave in the past, and they gave now out of their heart of generosity. And it's not even that they were rich. If we look at places like 2 Corinthians chapter 8, it talks about how most of the churches were struggling, including the Philippian church, but they wanted to give to Paul even sacrificially. But what's really interesting about this passage is why Paul is celebrating in that abundance. I mean, Paul says it really doesn't matter for him whether he gets this stuff or not because he's content. He's like, yo, I can live broke. I can live hungry. It doesn't matter. I, I live this type of way, but I'm really, really happy that you guys have given to me because I know it's not my own benefits that come from it, but I'm glad because your support is good for you. That generosity was good for you, for good for them. Our passage says this in verse 17, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Paul is basically saying that their generosity ultimately had met more benefits for them, that it actually added to their credit. He actually uses that word, that they're not losing out but they're gaining in their accounts. I mean, sometimes we think we can't afford to give our time, our energy, our money, 
But Paul is saying, no, you got it all wrong. He's saying you can't afford not to give. You can't afford not to give. I mean, we hear it all the time, right? To give is better than to receive. We say it. We say it to others, especially when they're being stingy. Yo, to, be- to give is better than to receive. But I mean, do we believe it in our own hearts? It's a biblical rule of thumb that is so interesting because it's repeated over and over again in Scripture. When you give, it's actually the giver that receives more than the receiver. Luke 6, 38 says this, give and it will be given to you. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, sow sparingly, reap sparingly, sow bountifully and reap bountifully. Proverbs eleven twenty four 24 says this, one gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. And it's so weird. I mean, there's a pattern and principle being explained here that when you give away, you get an increase. But when you consume and take things for yourself, you ultimately lose out. You know, there was this cute story that I came across while studying this thing called generosity. Um, It's about this farmer that constantly won every single year. He won the best corn award in this state every year, every year, every year. He would go to this county fair, submit his corn and he'd win. So reporters were really, really um, like curious, like, yo, what is this guy's secret? So he goes up to this guy. He's like, hey, what's your secret in getting the best corn every year? And the guy replied by saying this. It's simple. I share my seed corn with my neighbors. And the reporter was like, how does that help you? I mean, all those guys are entering the contest, too. Why would you give them your seed corn? And the farmer replied by saying this. Don't you know? That when the wind blows and picks up the pollen from the ripening corn, it swirls it around from field to field. If my neighbor grows inferior corn, cross-pollination will steadily degrade the quality of my own corn. If I'm to grow good corn, I must help my neighbors grow good corn. And this guy was talking about it. I mean, he could see further the benefits of benefiting others, that it ultimately goes around. And it's funny how everything really works together. I mean, this concept to give is better than to receive is so interesting because logically in our minds and emotionally in our hearts, it doesn't make sense. I mean, have you ever given something to somebody and then you realize that you kind of wanted it? Or like, you know, you you, you give offering and you're just like, dang, I could have bought a new power tool. I don't know. I mean, whatever you want. And you start thinking about it. So, you know, in my... So in my, so as I was thinking about this, I, I wanted to do some scholarly research on this. So what I did, what, what most of you guys would probably do, you went to Google and typed it in, did your scholarly research, and I wrote the benefits of generosity. And it was crazy how many different hits came out. I mean, if it was only one blog that said, yo, to give is better than to receive and said a bunch of stuff, I'd been like, all right, yeah, that's bogus. But over and over again, Ivy League school after Ivy League school was doing different studies on the benefits of generosity. Even hospitals and different health foundations were doing this over and over again. And they said this, that generosity played a huge role in better mental health and physical health for the giver. I mean, they said it lowered blood pressure, lowered the risk of mental disorders, lowered the risk of anxiety and depression. It reduced cardiovascular disease, and it brought more fulfillment and happiness in someone's life. And it was so effective. It was so effective that even doctors were at a point of saying, yo, this is a treatment for you. Go out there. Give something away. Go go volunteer at the local soup kitchen. Do something. Do something outside of yourself, and that will help you. I mean, this is like a win-win situation. People receiving stuff from them and also people receiving more when they give. And now researchers are reading these articles and they're like, oh, my gosh, this is such an amazing development. Oh, my gosh, we have to live generously. And then just like, dang, these are age old things that have been talked about in Scripture over and over and over again for thousands of years. And you know what? I believe it's true because you know why? Because I really believe that this is the design that humans were created for. I mean, if we really believe that we are made in the image of God made in the image of God, and we believe that God is a giver and not a taker. He's a giver, not a taker. And God created us out of the abundance of love that was inside himself. You know, sometimes people think, right, God created humanity because he needed relationships or he needed worship. That's not true. God had relationship and love within himself, his Trinitarian Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all coming together in one, three beings in one, and they had relationship within themselves. They had 
fulfillment in themselves, but he created out of the overflow. And this is what Paul is saying. You are, I mean, this is what the Bible is saying, that we are created in that image, created in that image. And when we live out this design, we find our purpose and true fulfillment in life. Paul shows that generosity moves in us and helps us live out our design. I mean, there's a reason why there's this inner joy that sprouts out of our hearts when we know we made a difference in someone's life. That inner joy that sprouts out of our hearts when we know we made a difference in someone's life. It's different than the so-called happy feelings we get when we receive a gift. Very different. Here in our passage, we see that generosity does a few things that brings joy to our lives. One, it says this, it builds relationships. Or in our passage, it says it builds partnership. Paul says, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians know yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. But this is the nature of generosity. It always involves another party. Generosity can never be done alone. I mean, it can't. I mean, lonely people have no one to be generous with, so they're not generous. Generous people often have a lot of people around them. You know, at first glance, Paul says that the Philippian church was the only church that supported in giving and receiving. But when we hear those terms, it almost sounds like cold, like, oh, they're just giving and receiving. It's like give and take and like technical accounting terms. But what we have to know that in the Greco-Roman world, those words are smothered in notions of friendship. This is not just the giving and taking of money, but the giving and taking of resources, of time, giving and taking of suffering, suffering together, sharing everything that is happening. It's giving and taping, giving and taking blessings, giving and receivings are idioms that point to a deep friendship. You know, what's sadder to me is not losing out when giving things away. The sadder thing is when you have no one in your life to be generous with. Generosity points to partnerships and relationships that we have with people. In L.A., I work with a lot of young adults and a handful of young professionals, and I believe they know the best that relationships are important with this thing called generosity because sometimes, you know, I'd go out with them and, and they'd take me to an expensive restaurant, and I'm like, dude, this is like mad, mad fancy. Why are you taking me here? And I'm like, oh, man, just save your money. And, and you know, most of the, the, the single guys, they just say grumpily, I have no girlfriend. I have no one to spend money on. Just take it. It's almost like inside their hearts, they're desperate to be generous. They want to be generous, but they got no one to be generous with. I wish I had someone I could buy a gift for and stress about. I wish I could spend my time and do something that's why they say young adults are probably the best for church plans because they give a lot of time because they, you know, they just want to be generous. Well, parents, we get sucked dry from our, parent, our, our kids and we're like, oh, we don't want nothing. Please leave me alone. But this is a huge insight, insight into contentment that has been a constant theme throughout our sermon series and largely the gospel itself, that contentment is found when you have concern for the well-being of others. If you spend your whole life worrying about you, you will probably never be content. But when you become lost in concern for others, there's a spiritual thing that happens. And I know there's people in this room that knows what that feels like. That time you went on to that mission trip and you've seen the eyes of the kids on your, the time that you have given them. The people that you have helped out in times of need and you knew you made a difference. The time when you planned out an entire event and you saw kids with joyful faces, that feeling of contentment. I mean, there is no amount of gaining that can bring you that. Have you experienced the blessing of blessing another person? You know, we're a new church and we had our public worship services, um, first public worship back in September 18th. This is less than three months three months ago. Our church is very young, and this is around the same time that I've been starting this sermon series in Philippines called Surprised by Joy. I mean, it's been a huge blessing on me because I feel like I've been preaching to myself every week. I mean, these are the things that I struggle with. But over the past three months after our launch services, by the grace of God, he built this church here in North Wales, and all you beautiful people are here worshiping with us. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I'm humbled to be a church with you. But in my prayer, I hope that we may be a generous church, a church that is not focused on 
just receiving blessings, but more concerned on giving blessings to others. Because this is the only way that we can live out our calling as a church plant. My prayer is that we'll be a church that serves the community. My prayer is that we'll be supporting missionaries and other church plants around us. That we will not keep our, our, our faith to ourselves, but we'll be sharing the greatest gift that we have received with other people around us. That we will not look only to our own interests, but look to the interests of others. Because I know that if we don't do that, our church will not be able to taste the blessings that come from blessing others. Let me ask you guys, I mean, what really is a church? It's not a building. It's not a pastor. It's not its leaders. It's not even the name Grace Point. It's not an organization, a logo, or just signs. But it's people that gather together in faith. A generous church is nothing other than a group of generous people. People that aren't just coming together to receive benefits, to check out to see if the church can fill needs, but people that are coming together to benefit others. A generous church is when people are more concerned on how they can contribute to the community rather than see what the community can provide for them. You know, the principles of contentment apply to the church and applies to different communities, applies to even nations. A church will never be able to fill all your needs. A pastor will not always have a good sermon that touches your heart every week. It's impossible. Programs won't always be on point, point and the community will not always be loving. I mean, especially as a church plant, we have more needs than, than anything we can actually provide. But it's those that have a heart of generosity that make of community work. And those that have a heart of generosity that find contentment wherever they are. The generosity is not just material needs. It's, it's sometimes that's the most easiest thing. But generosity is giving your heart in partnership. The heart that seeks to give one's time, one's energy, one's skills and talents, one's relationships, one's heart in service, even though it's sacrificial, it's those that are generous that find joy. And there's so many people working in the backgrounds of this church plant that have been faithfully serving. Those in the back, those in our children's ministry, they're never in this room because they're always there. Those that are passively praying. Those that are picking up pieces of trash on the floor when they see that it's kind of dirty. Those that are greeting new visitors even though it could be uncomfortable. They are serving when there's no glory or recognition. And I want to encourage you guys God sees you, and that generosity will not be ignored in heaven. Another thing, that God, Paul, another thing that Paul tells us about blessings of generosity is not only what generosity does to us, but where that generosity flows from. Verse 18 says this, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Aphrodite the gifts you sent a flagrant offering, and, accept, and a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. First, we see that Paul saw generosity as an act of worship. He saw that it was something that pleased God, like a fragrant offering that comes to him. I feel like Paul is adding different layers. He was like, if you can't be generous for the sake of other people, look at me and be generous for the sake of me. Look at me. Know that it's something that I'm pleased with. You know, in Matthew chapter 25, this is a powerful, powerful parable. I'm not going to even paraphrase it. I'm just going to read it because it's that powerful. Let me read this for you guys. It's when we are at the end of time, we're facing God at judgment day. And this is what is said. Before him will be gathered all nations and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. The sheep are his people. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed, blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the fountain of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying this, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or see you naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king replied by saying this, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. 
I mean, this is so powerful. It's so powerful. Your generosity is worship to me. And what's interesting about this passage is that the judge actually judges people based on their generosity. And at first I was like, what does this mean? I mean, I'm not that generous. Does it mean I'm doomed to hell? It's not where he's getting at. Generosity doesn't buy us a ticket to heaven. But what it does, it symbolizes the faith inside a person. Generosity shows how generous God was to our own souls. I mean, worship is a response to grace that we receive, and generosity is a method to that worship, meaning that if, a seed, if faith is a seed, generosity is a fruit that comes out. Because at the end of the day, the gospel is receiving the greatest gift to mankind, the greatest gift to mankind. And when you realize that gift, it changes us. When you know that you have received so much from God, it moves us. I mean, our passage goes on to say that we can know, we can give knowing that God, according to verse 19, will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That means in our faith, we will constantly be reminded of the riches we have in Christ. And those riches that come from Christ will not only supply our souls, but so much more in the life to come after. In simple words, when you know you are blessed and know you didn't deserve the grace that you received, you are moved to bless another person. You know, and it, my pastor in L.A., uh, my senior pastor in L.A., shared this story with me. He was, it was one of those mentoring moments. You know, I was a young guy that came in, and he was just sharing the story with me. He said when he came, first came to America, he studied at a school called Calvin Theological Seminary in Michigan. And he said as, a, as an immigrant student, the first thing he wanted to do was buy a cargo van. I was like, cargo van? I mean, you, know, you don't have that many kids yet. I mean, cargo van. He wanted to buy a cargo van, and he saved up his money and bought one of those things, one of the first things he ever bought. Not because he had a big family or needed one, but because he said he wanted to go around and pick up random furniture that was left up on the streets so he can gather them and give it to people that needed them. And at first I was like, what the heck? Like, this is what you wanted to do? You saved your life savings? And I knew this guy was broke because, you know, you hear sermons after a while. I mean, he was, he's a guy from Korea. You know, he's studying his butt off. It's not like he had that much time. He worked extra jobs just to pay for tuition. And I'm like, you bought a cargo van? How the heck does that help you? I mean, being an American-minded dude, I was just like questioning him. I was like, yo, that was so irresponsible. Like, why would you do that? Like, care for yourself, man. But this is what he said. He said, you know, Paul, I was moved to do this because I know how hard it is to be an immigrant student. I know what it feels like to not have furniture but not be able to get the free ones just because you don't have a vehicle to move it. Before I came to America, I studied in Australia. You know, I was a young student. There was people that invested in me when they didn't have anything to benefit from me, and they just gave to me. He was like, I was, I'm moved to do this. I've received so much. How can I not give back? And I don't know why. I think it might have been his deep voice that, that made me, like, tremble. Like, oh, this guy's holy. Or maybe it was his Korean accent that made him sound holy. I don't know. But it touched me, and I was challenged. But I couldn't help but think, maybe this is how the gospel works. When we really understand the gospel, when we understand that we have received riches from Christ when we didn't deserve it, we received his goodness, his righteousness, his perfection. And we, while we were sinners and didn't deserve it, and Christ sacrificed himself so that we can get it. I mean, do we see the fact that we don't deserve anything, but we have so much? That Christ gave us a new purpose, a new life, a new hope, paradise in heaven, a new family, a community. By dying on the cross, I mean, that shouldn't that move us? I mean, maybe we're not content because we fail to, fail to see the reality that we don't deserve what we have. I mean, have you guys ever thought about that? We don't deserve what we have. I mean, we don't deserve the great life, deserve the love that we have. We don't deserve our awesome spouses. We don't deserve the nice things that we have in our parents and our friends. We don't deserve them, but we have them. And it's a huge blessing. Isn't it true that we are discontent when we fail to see the grace and the blessings that we already have? Thankfulness doesn't come unless you know that you got something that you really don't deserve. And that's where the heart of generosity sprouts from. When you know you have received something so big and you didn't earn it. I mean, how many of you guys, 
How many of you guys would write a thank you letter to your boss when you receive a paycheck in the mail? None of you guys would. Because you're like, yo, I, I, I deserve that. I earned it. But it's different when you receive some bonus that wasn't supposed to be given to you. It's different. You're more generous with that. But imagine if you knew that everything in your life was given to, given to you by God. Do you know the gospel? Do you see the sacrifice that God made through Jesus Christ on the cross so that you may be innocent and free? May your generosity flow from that. You know, John Piper, a Christian author and pastor, once said this. The way we give reflects how we see God. Do we see God as a giver or a taker? Do we understand that God didn't just come and say, worship me, but he says that I want to give you everything, including myself, so that you may live? You know, I feel like many believers have lost that understanding of grace. We've become callous to it. I mean, we're like children that have received so much from our parents, and we just receive and receive and receive, and we forget that it comes from a great sacrifice and hard work that they do. May we never forget what we receive in Christ, and may it move us to a life of generosity, and may you experience the great blessings that flow from it. Amen? You know, if there are people in this room who do not know Christ and what is offered through the gospel and you would like to explore more, I mean, please grab me or anybody else that is serving. We would love to talk more about the gospel with you. There's another promise in Scripture that is given to us that God continues to supply our giving and God will not be in our debt. He will replenish our sacrifice, replenish our energy. He will give in return for what we sow and far more. I mean, I really think that an act of generosity is letting go of things that we hold on to and opening up our hands so we can receive what Christ wants to give to us in even more abundance. Let me just repeat it again. Generosity is not something we can't afford Generosity is something we can't afford not to do. Frederick Buettner says this, greed says that the more you get, the more you have. Christ says the more you give away in love, the more you are. Let us pray. Dear God, I just thank you so much, O oh Lord, that you remind us again of the gospel and all that we have received in you. Lord, I pray that we never take your love for granted, O oh Lord, that we never take, O oh Lord, the blessings in our life for granted, O oh Lord. That we don't think that we deserve things, O oh Lord, but we have received them as a blessing and gifts. And Lord, I pray that understanding that blessing, O oh Lord, may you move us to bless others, O oh Lord. May you move us to give, O oh Lord. May we, you move us, O oh Lord, to live a life of generosity for your kingdom. Dear God, there are people in this room that have real needs as well. Lord, I pray that you may provide for them, O oh Lord. There are those in this room, O oh Lord, that have prayer requests that they have been praying for over and over again. Lord, may you hear their requests and answer. Lord, I just pray, O oh Lord, that you may help us be a church that truly stands up, O oh Lord, in this community as salt and light to share the, great, the greatest gift that you have given to us, O oh Lord. And may we pour out, O oh Lord, pour out, O oh Lord, onto our communities and the people around us. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Feel free to remain seated as we respond and work. Amen.